if you're faking your voice, yeah, you can't. Then it's going to be tough to reproduce that. Like, God forbid, they love it, and then they want you to do the second one, and you're like, oh, I can't. You know, I don't know how to get back into that. You got to be yourself. Speak the way. I mean, I'm not saying speak the way you speak, but you have your creative voice. You have your style. Style is really important. Don't copy someone else's because it's pretty obvious. This episode is brought to you by Bulletproof Script Coverage, where screenwriters go to get their scripts read by top Hollywood professionals. Learn more at CoverMyScreenplay.com. I'd like to welcome to the show Jeff Schimmel, man. Thank you so much for taking the time out to be on the show today. Thanks for having me, Alex. I appreciate it. And we're going to get into the weeds of screenwriting and, uh, and your book, amazing book, Maximum Screenwriting. So first and foremost, how did you get into this crazy business? <laughs> Okay, it's really um, a story that I don't think anyone will ever duplicate. Um, I was in law school out in LA and I was trying to finish up. And one night I had a dream. I actually dreamed a movie. And I woke up in the morning and said, wow, I would pay to see that. That was such a cool story. It was a, a Cold War spy movie. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, this was in the, in the late 80s. So I was thinking, wow, Charles Bronson could play the Russian spy and Clint Eastwood could play the American spy. And as I was sitting in, in class for the next few days, I was just writing notes and trying to remember as much of the dream as I could. Mm -hmm. And through a really bizarre chain of events, I ended up pitching the idea. I, I didn't even know what pitching was. Mm -hmm. I ended up pitching the idea for the movie to J.J. Abrams' father, Jerry Abrams. <laughs> uh, he was a partner in a company called Phoenix Entertainment Group. So it was Jerry Abrams and Jerry Eisenberg, I think. They were the two Jerrys. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, I, I sold the story to them. I got an agent. And then I went back to school and I was just doing my work. I never thought I would have another idea worth talking about but all of a sudden i had an agent it was crazy that's and, uh, that's not generally that's not the way it's done no and you know had i known that jj abrams was going to turn out to be who he is i would have been a lot nicer to jerry abrams i probably would have <laughs> tried to babysit jj or something <laughs> um so that happened and then right after that Every now and then I would call my agent and I would say, is there something I should be doing? And he said, yeah, study for the bar exam. You know, you're not a writer. You're not really in this business. And my brother, who was a stand up comic, did Rodney Dangerfield's uh, Young Comedian Special for HBO. Yeah. And I was going up to Las Vegas to meet Rodney with my brother. And I called my agent and told him, hey, you know, I'm going out of town to meet Rodney Dangerfield. Uh, and he said, you're not going to believe this. I just got the script to Rodney's new movie, his next movie. I just got it delivered to me. It's on my desk. So if you want to read it, come by, pick it up. So I read it in the car on the way to Las Vegas. And when I met Rodney at the crap table, at Caesar's Palace, I said, I just read the script to your next movie and it's not funny. <laughs> and uh, he was stunned by that. And he invited me to it was to his show that night. He invited me to dinner afterwards. And we just sat in his hotel room and he had a joint in one hand, a glass of vodka in the other hand. And I just sat at the way at the other end of the dining table, just telling him why I thought it wasn't a funny movie. Mm hmm. And, how, and, and where did uh, that go? <laughs> um, he listened and I told him, I, you know, look, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of yours and I'm a big fan of comedy. And, you know, I grew up watching you on Ed Sullivan and The Tonight Show. And I've seen all your movies and I, I just can't believe you're doing this. And uh, he took my name and number down. He put it in his robe pocket. And I thought for sure he won't remember that what he did with my number but two weeks later he called me he left me a message and he was and he was like jeff rodney you know i i prepaid a ticket for you okay you know he invited me to come to new york and and stay in a hotel for the weekend and i ended up moving in with him for a year wow and that's how i that's how i really got started and it was such a crazy thing because i had no idea what i was doing he didn't know that i really had no idea and then one day there was a knock at the door and harold ramus showed up jesus and rodney and harold and i sat in rodney's kitchen writing a movie together and it was so nerve-wracking because i just didn't have a clue i love movies i 
I don't know anybody that's into movies more than I am, mm -hmm. but I didn't know what I was doing. And I would have to wait till three in the morning until Rodney went to sleep to sneak into my bedroom in his apartment and read, you know, um, Sid Field. <laughs> Sid Field. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Holy cow. So you literally got thrown into this business. Yeah, it was nuts. Um, and then as a result of um, that happening, I came back to L.A. after living with Rodney and um, my agent called me and said, how would you like to work on a sitcom? And I said, I, I wouldn't. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big movie writer now. You know, why would I stoop to that? <laughs> and it's just so dumb. And you know what? That's why that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book and teach the classes uh, is because no one told me anything when I was starting out. They never gave me advice. They didn't warn me about the dumb stuff. Uh, you know, here's what to say. Here's what to never say. <laughs> and so I try to warn people about the, these things. And, you know, some people take it and some people just think, no, you know, that won't happen to me. But of course it, it does. It, of course it does. And it doesn't matter. Oh, that was that happened in the eighties. That wouldn't happen like that now. Yeah, it would. <laughs> yeah, it would. Of course. <laughs> so that's the reason why you came up with the book. Yes. And and so tell us a little bit about maximum screenwriting. Okay, so I'm going to show it to you. Here it is. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's stunning. Uh, it's, stunning. <laughs> it's cool. It's stunning. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. It has it has a five star rating, which I'm really proud of, especially considering it's higher rated than the Bible. <laughs> um but fair, fair enough <laughs> it's, it's amazing i'm gonna use that one in my new book <laughs> okay so i teach classes across the country and invariably this is so interesting at least to me it doesn't matter where i go people have the same questions and usually the first question they'll ask is how do i get an agent and my answer immediately is uh why is your script done and usually they'll say, well, no. And then I'll tell them, well, then don't worry about getting an agent. You're not ready. And the last thing you want to do is uh, annoy an agent or try to get their attention. And then, you know, you win the booby prize. They are willing to read and then you don't have your script. Mm -hmm. But I started noticing that the same questions would come up, like I said, no matter where I would be. Uh, and no matter, who, you know, male, female, young, old, experienced, no experience, they always ask me the same question. So I wrote this book that's 25 of those questions and my answers. But it, they're long questions and very long answers. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Very long. So um, what is one tip that you would give a writer who wants to start right, you know, try to get a writing gig on TV or as a feature film in a feature film? Uh, well, you can't get one of those things. You're not going to get a, a TV job. Or, by the way, I sound very absolute, don't I? Like, you're not, <laughs> this is not going to happen. But you're not going to get uh, a job on TV, writing for TV, unless you have a great sample. You're not going to get anywhere in the feature world if you don't have a great sample or two or three. And you're not going to have a great sample if you don't outline the hell out of whatever it is you're writing. Mm -hmm. And that's my biggest thing, outlining and and following through and staying true to your outline and not going off on these crazy tangents. Because if you do, I can pretty much predict you're going to quit at about page 55. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have half written screenplays all over. Oh, yeah. And, you know, but they don't finish because they get lost in their own story because they didn't have a good outline. So. That's a long answer to a short question. You know, I'm, I'm when I write, I always outline as well. When I wrote my book, when I write screenplays, I always because it's just it's a it's a uh, what is it, a roadmap for yeah. you on your story because you will get lost in the weeds. You will get lost in the weeds of the story and the character and the plot and things like that. But if you have these kind of um, markers on the road, it, at least you can go back. And it doesn't. A lot of people always say that they feel that. Um, that outlines stifle creativity. And I, th I say the opposite. It just gives you a structure. Like we wouldn't be walking without the structure of our bones. You need a structure. Right. And without the structure, you might be creating, but you're not creating anything that you previously thought you needed. Right. So now all of a sudden you're going off on something else and it might be great and that's awesome. But I think if you stay true to the outline, you will 
eventually uh, finish, and then you can always go back and rewrite. And that's another word of advice I have for people. Don't hate rewriting. Oh. If you make rewriting fun, and for me, that I love rewriting more than I like writing the first draft. And and so. also rewriting, I, I always find myself, and it's a bad habit, and I try not to do it, is rewriting while you're writing. And that's a horrible, horrible thing. And so many young writers will spend a month on one page because they're right. rewriting it and rewriting it. Okay, so do you want me to tell you Please. why writers Please. do that? Yes. It's a symptom of a couple of different kinds of fear that are going on. But look at it this way. If you never finish, you never have to find out if your script is any good. Fair enough. So it's it's much easier to just say, you know, I'm going to go back to page one and I'm going to write up to this point. Let's say I'm on page 15. I'm going to keep going back and honing it and, and paring it down and punching it up and changing some words. And OK, that's great. But you're going to end up with a solid 15 pages and nothing more than that, because you're probably afraid that you're going to end up with something that's just not up to snuff. And then you don't want to hear that. And it's all subconscious. It's not like you're sitting there saying, oh, my God, what if this is no good? Mm -hmm. No, you're you're not thinking that you just you don't know why you're doing it. You're just you just continue to keep going back. Well, let's talk on that on that subject for a second. Fear, fear. Yeah. You know, there's a great book called The War of Art by um, the Stephen Pressfield, which is an amazing book on how to conquer your fear as a as a writer. What are your techniques on trying to conquer that fear? Because it is, I mean, looking at that white screen with the blinking cursor is terrifying for, yeah. for most writers even the most skilled writers in the world it's for that one second it is pretty terrifying so what do you what are some tips on how to break through that fear okay well i can tell tell you where this comes from because i'm not a genius but uh i used to sit at my computer and watch the cursor blink for hours even if i had a deadline that was imposed externally and i needed to turn something in I would sit there and stare at it. And it got to the point where I wanted to find out what was wrong with me. If I mean, if I could tell people I'm passionate about a script, but I can't seem to start working on it, there's got to be something wrong somewhere. So I went to a therapist who had just graduated from college. She was doing her um, a certain number of hours that you need, yeah. to, mm -hmm. you know, it's a requirement before you can get your License. Like a residency almost. Right. Yeah. So I went to her. She was brand new. And I told her what my problem was. And she just like that just answered it. And she explained fear to me. And she said, you know, there's a couple of different kinds of fear. There's fear of success and fear of failure. And I said, well, I can't possibly have a fear of success because, I mean, I want to make it and I want to get rich and I want to have a big house in the hills and, you know, have people over and, you know, all that. And she said, OK, but you're looking at success in the wrong way. You're looking at it very superficially, but there's a lot more to it than that. I mean, if you're if you write a script and you're successful with it, guess what? You have to duplicate that. And what if your fear is that you can't live up to it? What if you can't do it again? You caught lightning in a bottle, but it really wasn't you. Some things came together and you got it done and you sold it, but that may never happen again. So that's a fear. A fear of failure is similar in some ways that what if I write something and it never pans out and no one likes it and I get exposed. Oh my God, I got found out. I don't have any talent, blah, 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 whatever. Imposter, well, imposter syndrome. It's enough to stop you cold. Yeah. I mean, like you won't do anything because you don't want to hear those words. So you have those things happening. And if you're really unlucky and a very creative, by the way, this occurs to more intelligent people, like people that are dumb don't have this problem. <laughs> You know, they're not sitting there worrying about whether or not they have enough talent to pull something off. They're they're basically sitting there contemplating lame stuff that has nothing to do with anything. But if you're a little bit intelligent or a lot and, and you've got some talent, uh, that is what you're worried about. So you will sit there and watch the cursor blink because you don't want to end up in one being, you know, having one fear or the other play out in your life. 
But there is a cure to that. And it's one of the things that I actually teach in my class. I do an hour lecture on how to kill procrastination. And it's actually very simple. And if I tell you here, no one will come to my class. So. <laughs> you can tell me after we, we, we cut the recording, sir. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to get suckered into that. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, before we keep going, I wanted to ask you about your time and in living color, because okay. it was, it, that that show is, uh, you know, I love that show, and it was such a landmark sh uh, series. How did you get right. involved with it? And what was it like writing for a show that that it seemed, from at least from the outside, so crazy? They had no rules almost, so like, you know, where Saturday Night Live might have had some sort of like. You know, rains in living color seemed to me at least had none. Uh, right. at the, you know, at least in the heyday of in living color. So, what did you well, think? I think the climate at that time uh, had to allow for uh, you know Keenan to stretch out more and do more. Um, and it was really an experiment. Uh, if you remember, that was right after like Hollywood Shuffle yeah. came out. Yeah, yeah. And Hollywood was forced all of a sudden to look at different things. I mean, other stuff was happening. Boys in the Hood was happening. And there was a lot of stuff that was making people pay attention to, to different stuff for the first time. Um, so Keenan created the show and I tried to get a writing job the first season that it was on. And now I had done two TV shows before that, and I was actually working on a comedy show called Sunday Comics that Fox was doing, uh, which was a lot of fun. It was great. I did a series of short films for, for that show. Uh, and then I went and I pitched to In Living Color. I didn't make the cut, but the second season, then I did. So I got on the show. And it was crazy. Um, I can tell you that seeing Jim Carrey in what I consider to be his infancy. Yeah. Uh, and people like David Allen Greer. I saw David Allen Greer not long ago, and I can't even look at him without laughing because he's so funny. <laughs> My favorite thing on the show was watching him in rehearsals mm -hmm. because he, you know, he's a Yale trained actor. <laughs> And he would turn the most ridiculous stuff into really funny stuff in a rehearsal, but he wouldn't do that on the show. But mm -hmm. I just used to sit there and laugh until it hurt. He was great. Um, there was a day that Jim Carrey pissed Keenan off so much that he was pretty much fired from the show and then rehired later in the day. Um, <laughs> can you tell I, us what? Can you tell us what it was? We can't say it. Yeah, of course. He. We were in a table read, and. I guess there was a sketch that Jim didn't want to do. And he stood up and he did that thing where he bends over and talks out of his butt. <laughs> yes. The Ace Ventura thing, that, right? Yeah, he did that kind of pointing his his ass at Keenan and it didn't go over. <laughs> so uh I was I had an office upstairs um and I was the only one I think that had a couch in their office and so Jim Carrey was laying on my couch that day, wondering about whether or not he was going to have a job. And now I, you know, when I think back on it, it's like, wow, that that was wild. Keenan had his own way of doing things. He created his own template for writing sketches. So uh, you couldn't just take a standard or, you know, some kind of pre-existing format and use that. So we had to all learn that. And he made everybody take a crack at pretty much every sketch. So if you pitched something and he picked it, you would write the first draft, but then it would get passed around to 20 other writers. And by the time it got back to you, it was unrecognizable. Right. So, you know, being there during Jim's uh, infancy, I imagine he was one of the breakout stars uh, during oh, yeah. that time. And I know before Ace Ventura, that really blew him up. He was he was the white guy on the Living Color. That's what right. everyone knew him as, is you know, and Farmer exactly. Marshall Bill and all of his great characters. Right. That must have been insane to be front row to that. Yeah, it was, and you know. Uh, I think a lot of people probably didn't realize the staying power that what we were doing had, mm -hmm. you know, not just within a matter of weeks, months, whatever, but over the years. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's on uh, several times a night on, I don't even remember what channel it is, but every now and then I'll see it in the, in the channel guide and I'll watch it for a few minutes and it's it's just 
you know, silly. But I remember the night, actually, Jim was the only cast member that had a an office up on the second floor where the writers were. Mm -hmm. And one night I was leaving, we used to leave very late at night. Mm -hmm. And one night I was leaving probably two in the morning. Mm -hmm. And Jim was in his office with another guy. And they were writing something. And I kind of just walked in and sat there and I was introduced to Tom Shadiak. He was the other yeah. guy that was in there. <laughs> and Tom Shadiak ended up uh, directing Ace Ventura. And I remember them telling me about the script. <laughs> and I walked out to the parking garage and I was like, okay, you know. Pet detective, right. sure, why not? Yeah, of course. And when it came out, I don't know if you remember this, oh, yeah. but when the movie came out, Hollywood Reporter and a lot of uh, other publications just killed the movie. Oh, yeah. There, this is a D minus. This is garbage. And it was such a huge hit. Uh, it really launched Jim, you know, and Tom. exponentially beyond, you know, in living color. Um, but yeah, I, I remember that night meeting him and Tom Shadiak and I had something in common. We both wrote for Bob Hope. Oh, wow. Um, and I think I, I know for a fact I was a writer and like associate producer on the last special he ever did for NBC. Uh, which was another crazy story. That was just, I got fired off of that job for <laughs> caring too much about Bob Hope. <laughs> yeah. It yeah. sounds like, it sounds like you could write at least two or three more books just on your stories alone. Yeah. Yeah. I love Bob Hope. I mean, I grew up watching him on TV and in the movies. He did some movies that I thought were funny. I mean, he and Bing Crosby pretty much invented the the buddy comedy. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, without question. The road movies. And when I met Bob Hope, I think he was 94 years old. I went to his house and I met him and he would start to talk and fall asleep in the middle of a sentence. So his daughter would wake him up and so he could finish the story. And I was like, wait a minute, we're putting him on TV like this. You know, he's going to be trying to recount his his, you know, uh, performances for presidents and stuff like that. And he's going to, you know, say, you know, yeah, boy, I was with JFK in the South Pacific. Yeah. You know, <laughs> So I told his daughter, who was the executive producer of the show, I love your dad. Um, he's one of my idols and he he doesn't look good. You know, his 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 eyes are droopy. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. He's, all he's that. Like, and, you know, let's not do this to him. And she was like, wow, you know, I'm, I'm impressed with the fact that you care so much. And then I got fired. So, <laughs> yeah. Then moral of the story is don't tell the truth. This is not the business to tell the truth. <laughs> Touche, sir. Now, what are um, some of the most commonly seen mistakes or issues you see with, with first-time screenwriters or screenwriters in general with their teleplays or their screenplays? Okay. I would say one thing is uh, that a lot of people think the rules don't apply to them. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are rules as you know, and I know, and everyone knows, there are certain things you have to conform to. And, you know, you, you could have a great idea for a movie, but you're not going to write it on a co cocktail napkin and get an executive to, to read it. So there are certain rules. And, uh, but there are people that think, no, 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 my story is so great. Transcends. <laughs> yes. I don't have to follow that. Okay, great. Go for it. Um, a lot of people don't believe that uh, stories lay out pretty much the way they have always laid out since, you know, ancient Greeks were telling each other stories. You know, stories feel a certain way to us, you know, from the, when we're laying in bed, when we're little kids and our parents are telling us stories or reading us books, we start to learn about how stories lay out. Mm hmm. And you don't want to. Yes. OK, so someone you probably heard this, too. I don't remember where I learned this, but you want to know how a story ends. You just don't want to know how you get there. You know, the 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 fun part is the roller coaster ride, you know, the twists and turns that you can't really anticipate. But it does have to pay off in a certain way. And people think, no, 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 that doesn't apply to me. You know, I don't have to do things that way. My script can be 200 pages long because it's so the story's so good at nothing can be cut, you know. And when I hear that, <laughs> it's like, OK, 
Yes, yes. Go for it. Unless your yeah. last name is Sorkin or Black, it's really you can't really get away with a 200 page script. <laughs> no. And and even if you do get away, with, even if you're someone else and you do get away with it at some point, they are going to say, unless you're directing it, you better pare it down. I mean, if you're directing it, you know what you want to get out of it. But right. Do you know do you know who Ed Louder was? No. OK. Uh, by the way, am I ruining your flow here? No, by... please go for it. Okay, so Ed Lauder was the actor in the original Longest Yard. He played yeah. Captain Knauer, the mm -hmm. the you know the main prison guard, mm -hmm. and he was in a lot of great movies. Um, so one day, back in the late '80s, early '90s, probably no later than '90, when people when we used to go and print our scripts out mm -hmm. at the at the copy place. Mm -hmm. Uh, bring a little floppy disk. Uh, I was in there waiting for a script to be printed and Ed Lauder walked in and I started telling him his movie credits, you know, as if he needed to know right. about his own career. And he had a floppy disk and he gave it to the girl that worked there and he said, please print out my script. So he was telling me he wrote a script. I'll never forget. It was called Oh No, Roberto. Okay. And he said, I've been working on this for years and, and finally I'm done with it. And uh, the girl came back with a stack of pages like this. Oh. So he said, I only wanted one copy. And she said, this is one copy. <laughs> it was a 400-page screenplay. He didn't realize it was a 400-page screenplay? No, because do you remember uh, something called Warren Script Applications? Yeah. That was a precursor to like Final Draft yeah. and Movie Magic and all that. Mm -hmm. So... He wrote this, I don't know how, but it was 400 pages. And he said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I can't cut this down. So I said, give it to me, Ed. And I started flipping through the pages. And I said, if you get rid of all the mores and continues, Nat, you're going to probably be able to cut 50 pages out. <laughs> Just like that. Right. And, you know, why don't you maybe do this and do that? And we had this really nice conversation. But I mean, I've seen it in real life. I've seen people write monsters. How do you fix a 400 page script? You, 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 you make it into a, a trilogy like like Lucas did. <laughs> right. It's yeah. But I mean, the things the things that come up are ridiculous. I mean, there's people that say, you know what I want to do? I want to be the guy to write the next Iron Man movie. What, okay. Why, but why? Probably, probably not going to happen unless you can convince the studio based on your previous work that you have the chops necessary to do that. You know, DC Comics and Marvel are gigantic franchises. A studio is not going to look at a brand new writer who has nothing to show yeah. and say, we want you. It's a very ignorant way of, of looking at things. Uh I mean, you could you could argue with um, what's his name, uh, Kugler, Ryan Kugler, who did uh, Black Panther. He had already done one or two features prior to that, and then they gave him two hundred million dollars to write, co-write, and, and and do that, and he did very well with it. Yeah. But you know, that's a that's a rarity, and he's also the director, right? Uh, yeah. Well, that, that helps. That I, always helps. I believe. Uh, first of all, at my age, it's so weird when I see myself like I look like Moses right now. But anyway, <laughs> um, I believe and I tell people you should probably aim at the bullseye. Like if you're trying to get somewhere, aim at the bullseye. Don't try to aim at the, the edges and try to be the one in a million person that's going to get away with it. It, it. Look, the odds are it's not going to it's not going to work. Uh, can I say that? You know, it, for sure, you it will never pan out. No, I can't say that. But what I can say is, if you're writing a comedy, let's say you're writing a broad comedy, try to keep it within the realm of successful broad comedies. If you're inventing some other thing, you know, good luck to you. I just don't see it. I can't coach someone and say, yes, go for it. Right. You know, and, you know, something else that goes along with it is if you're going to write a comedy, make it funny, please. You know? <laughs> just a, just a small thing. Just a small thing. 
just a little thing. Make it funny. Now, uh, this is a, this is a a lost art or a, an art that's never been actually created as an art. But how should screenwriters talk to executives? <laughs> you know, like it it is a very they, you know it's one thing learning the craft and this and that. But when you get in that room, you don't know what to do. It's it's kind of like you didn't even write anything. You really right. need to understand that process. Right. Well. Okay. So. A, be confident. Mm -hmm. um, they need you as much as you need them. Without writers, there's there's nothing to shoot. There's no TV and there's no films, right? So they do need you. Even if you're a fledgling writer, you're there for a reason. But you remember in the beginning of uh, Raging Bull when, when Robert De Niro as Jake LaMotta was in his dressing room, mm -hmm. he was about to go out and perform, and he kept on repeating, you're the boss, you're the boss, you're the boss? That's not a bad idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're a new writer and, you're, and you're, you're not used to going into these meetings, it wouldn't be a bad thing to stand or sit out in the waiting area and just think, I'm the boss. I'm running this meeting. I mean, they might be behind the desk and they may be the one asking the questions, but they're not going to push me around. At least not too much. <laughs> but you need to have that in your head first. Um, another thing, and I know this sounds really crazy, but you asked me, so I'm going to tell you. Sure. Okay. If you walk into an executive's office and you've never been there before, take a split second to look yes. around the office. Yes. If they've got a Boston Celtics jersey signed by Bobby Bird framed and on the wall, talk about it. If they have some unique piece of furniture that a lot of other people wouldn't have or you would never expect to see that in an executive's office, ask them about it. Talk about it because now you're talking to them about something you know they like. Mm -hmm. You don't have to just make small talk like this inane, you know, talk that doesn't mean anything. How are you? You know, what's new? What are you working on? OK, whatever, you know. Um, <laughs> but if you can talk to them about something they get excited about, well, they probably already like you by the time you're getting around to talking business. And what's wrong with that? That is something that that, that writers and filmmakers underestimate is that power to connect with them as a human being. Um, right. And, you know, all things being equal, you're talented, you've got a good script, um, everything being equal, they're always going to pick the person they have some sort of human connection with, even if yeah. it's as superficial as I love Larry Bird, too. I've got a signed yeah. autograph jersey in my house. Right. That alone is it, it, it goes so long and they don't teach that anywhere. No, they don't. Uh, yeah. I do in my I, class. Of course you do in your class, sir. I but, do in my class. But like at film schools or, or you know, or big institutions, they don't teach stuff like that. No. It, it is unwritten rules. Yeah, I went to, a, and like I said before, you know, no one told me anything when I was starting out because mm -hmm. for some reason writers, maybe I, they still do it. But at that time, for sure, everyone looked at each other like competition. Yeah. But how was I as a new writer competition to someone that had a ton of credits and we weren't going up for the same jobs? <laughs> Why would you not give me some helpful hints along the way? I mean, I'm not preventing you from working, you know, but but that's the way it was. But I like to tell people these things. And again, a lot of them, people think like, ah, that's baloney that, you know, that can't be true. No, if I'm telling you, then it's true. I mean, I don't get anything out of lying to you. <laughs> exactly. And that's ego. I, I, did meet, I did go to a meeting once and I met a guy. Okay, I'll tell you a great one and a horrible one. Okay. I met a guy who m mentioned Myrna Loy. Mm -hmm. So Myrna Loy was an actress from way back in the 40s, 30s and 40s, I'm pretty sure. And he mentioned Myrna Loy. And I, I think he thought I wouldn't know who that was. And I immediately started talking about Myrna Loy and then said, by the way, you know, I used to have an office on the Sony lot and I was in the Myrna Loy building. Well, we connected on Myrna Loy. <laughs> I, and all of a sudden, the meeting just became like two pals sitting in a bar talking to each other. We're still friends. That had to have been 10 or 11 years ago. And we're we're friends as a result of Myrna Loy. Right. Um, the bad meeting, I can tell you, this is such a great one. That's probably a better story. <laughs> I went, yeah. But see, the, the other one, though, serves a purpose because yes. you know that you talk about something. Sure. Okay. Something important. So 
Um, I went into this meeting once at Fox and I walk in and the executive is sitting there. I sit on the couch and he's playing those electronic drumsticks on his desk. You know, they're not plugged into anything. They're just like wireless and fairly, fairly douchey, fairly douchey. Yes. He's playing the drums on his desk and he's like, Hey, how you doing? And I said, great. And uh, so he was like, so your agent sent you in and he's still playing the drums. He put the drumsticks down and I thought, well, now we're going to get to business. And I'm not kidding. This is real. He picked up a little like remote control thing and he started flying. He, a helicopter took off from his desk <laughs> and it was making this really high pitched sound like right. It took off from the desk and he was flying it around the office. <laughs> While I'm trying to talk to him about the project what an he was allegedly interested in. And he's making he made it land on the coffee table in front of me. And then it took off and flew around and it landed on his desk. And I started noticing as if that wasn't enough. He had a bunch of scripts thrown around that were open to the middle and like laid down. He never read anything all the way through. It looked like he had just had a bunch of half read scripts. <laughs> And nothing, that meeting went nowhere. I mean, it was just him playing with stuff. And I just stopped talking. And when I stopped talking, the meeting was over because he had nothing to say. Wow. What was that, it was, that was the second worst meeting I've ever had. Well, you have to tell us now what the first worst <laughs> meeting was, obviously. The first meeting was so bad that I was thrown out of the office so fast that the valet didn't have a chance to park my car yet. <laughs> so when I came down, the valet said, oh, did you leave something in your car? And I said, no, I'm done. And I gave him the valet ticket and a tip and I drove away. What, what, so what happened at that meeting? <laughs> I, this was back in 2008. I had just come back from overseas. I was gone for a while. And my agent said, you know, because of the strike, yeah, right. Um, That's a big story. You know, there's very few jobs out there that you can get. So if I were you, I would start really paying attention to unscripted television. And I think at that time, at that by then, I hadn't watched too much reality television. Maybe with my wife, I'd mm -hmm. watch like Bachelor or something. But I really didn't know anything about it. And I was so heartbroken to hear that but i started watching shows and i came up with an idea for a show that was very much like the bachelor but it was about a guy who met 25 women and he was trying to find the perfect girl for him the only difference was that he was currently married so <laughs> the bachelor was the adulterer oh and this was a guy who was ready to file for divorce right just looking for a soft place to land. Oh, man. Like when I get out of my marriage, who's who am I going to be is, with? This is fairly brutal. <laughs> well, see, I told him I didn't want to really come up with these ideas. <laughs> so what I didn't know was that the woman I was pitching the idea to was going through a horrible divorce. All right. And apparently oh. her husband cheated on her and she really she kicked me out. I was probably about a minute into the pitch, maybe a minute and a half. Right. And she stood up and said the meeting's over. And that was it. He's please get out. Wow. That's yeah. just bad timing, sir. <laughs> you know what? I think that show could I still think it could work. Yeah, on v was, I could I'll see that on VH1 or, or Bravo. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, these uh, the people that are on The Bachelor and The Bachelorette, they just want to win. Yeah. Like at a certain point, I don't think they care who the person is. They just want to be the last one standing. Yeah, of course, of course. So, yeah, I think, and by the way, the, the they don't know that he's married until you're like 10 episodes in. It's like Joe Millionaire back in the day. Yeah. yeah I love that show. I thought that was a great show. <laughs> was yeah. Like, that so, was I don't know. I think it could work. I think it could work. Now, back to your book. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of writers have um, it's this fantastic book. Um, a lot of writers have uh, what we like to call the writer's block. What do you suggest about breaking through that kind of like you know procrastination or I am blocked? I personally don't believe in writer's block. I do believe that there's 
there's things that stop you, but mm-hmm. there are techniques that you can use to get that flow going again, personally. Uh, right. what do you, what's, your, what's your vibe on it? Okay, well, first of all, I forgot to tell you this, that the my cure for procrastination is in the book. Okay. It's in here. Okay, so go to Amazon and get it. Yes. Um, but as far as writer's block goes, to a certain extent, I agree with you. I think it's a... It's like a defense mechanism or it's kind of a, you know, it's a it's a creation out of some need for something. But this is what I suggest. Go to a movie. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I would say. If you have writer's block, if you're sitting there going, I can't think my way out of this or it's not just I can't get going. I just can't think my way out of this. Well, I would say this. Go to a movie. Take it easy. Relax. Forget about your thing that you're writing. Go watch a movie, sit in a theater for a couple of hours in the dark with strangers right. and and watch a movie and get lost in it. If you're writing, let's say you're writing a romantic comedy, mm-hmm. why don't you like go on Netflix and watch a couple of romantic comedies? Because you'll start to see how other people figured out what they were trying to do. Right. And it might spur something. You know, you might go, oh, yeah, you know, I... Um, I could do that. Not that, but I could I could see a way out of where I'm stuck right now. I don't think it's that big of a deal. I mean, I guess I agree with you. You know, I, 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 yeah, I mean, you. there are moments when you're just like, man, where am I going to go with this? And I'll either watch a movie or I'll read something or, you know, just kind of get other get outside of what you're doing, whatever that might be, even if right. it's going to a park and watching people watch yeah. that alone could spark ideas. Um, yeah. And there's just, Walk away. yeah, it's just different ways you can go back into your own past and your own stories, people, you know, and start thinking about those kind of things and, and it, it'll just come, but you just when gotta, people, be, yeah, no, I agree. And when people tell me, for example, another thing that I have similar advice for when they say, you know what, I finished my script yesterday and, uh, I'm already rewriting it. I tell them, you know what, don't put it in a drawer. Mm -hmm. and don't think about it for two weeks. This is what I usually say. Don't even think about it. Now, that doesn't mean start working on something else. It just means leave it alone, because if you come back to it with fresh eyes, you'll notice things on your own that you've never seen before. Yep. You'll see things that you were so used to reading and rereading while you were writing that they just became whatever, automatic in your head. But after you haven't looked at it for a while, it'll seem different and you might spot things that you like more or like a lot less. So before you rewrite, get away from it and then come back and look at it. And also, you know, if you're going to give it to your parents and your friends to read (laughs) and your wife and all that, just let them say what they want to say about it. But, you know, unless they're giving you the money to make it, like people are people don't read scripts even a lot of writers don't read scripts so if you're going to give it to your parents and hope to get notes what are your parents going to say well if they're jewish parents then they're going to say oh my god this is fantastic i'm jewish by the way i'm not like (laughs) being anti-jewish i'm the opposite yeah 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 saying is like if i gave a script to my parents if they bothered to read it they would have said oh my god this is fantastic we're going to show our friends sure 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 no question they get real a real critique from anybody that likes you what are they going to say this is horrible yeah it's a rough place to be if you're put in that position generally if you know the person unless they really truly are good friends and you really do have uh you're an educated reader let's say and give you really good notes then that's a different conversation right what advice do you have for screenwriters to help them stand outside of this insane crowd of competition if you will um or just product i don't say competition because i truly don't believe that I can compete against Aaron Sorkin and or, or Shane Black or Quentin Tarantino because they have such unique voices. Right. But um, but how do film how how do screenwriters uh, generally, in your opinion, try to stand out of the crowd? How can they make an agent or a manager, a producer, an executive take notice? Write something good. You read my mind. <laughs> Next question. Next question. Write uh, something really, really good. <laughs> write something really good. No, I mean, look, if you're faking your voice, 
Yeah, you can't. Then it's going to be tough to reproduce that. Like, God forbid, they love it, and then they want you to do the second one, and you're like, oh, I can't. You know, I don't know how to get back into that. You got to be yourself. Speak the way, I mean, I'm not saying speak the way you speak, but you have your creative voice. You have your style. Style is really important. Don't copy someone else's because it's pretty obvious. Right. Doing that, you know? But be yourself and be uh put your energy your creativity your view of things you know your perception of things and you live or die with that try it and and if people respond to it then you're on the right track and if they don't you might still be on the right track and they just don't see it there's a it's tough. It, it's tough. The whole the whole process is tough, um, to say the least. Now, what are your feelings on festivals and contests? Uh, probably that they're the worst thing ever created <laughs> uh, for screenwriters. Yeah, and and I know that there's some people that are not going to like me for saying that, but sure. uh, I'm still right. Uh, <laughs> look, it's math. And sometimes when I teach a class, I actually do the math on the dry erase board and I'll show them, you know, if this many people sign up and they pay this much and there's this many weeks of judging that goes on and blah, 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 whatever. Um, <clears throat> it's a money making factory. That's what it is for the people that run the contest. They can't guarantee you, even if you win, even if you're lucky enough to win. <clears throat> You're going to get a giant cardboard check for X amount of dollars. They're going to put it on their website, that picture of you holding it. Uh, can they get you an agent? No. Can they get you a deal? No. Uh, they can make a lot of money. And by the way, you won, but let's say there's 5,000 other people that didn't win. Well, they're going to get bombarded with emails saying, you know, you came so close. You were a quarter finalist or a semi-finalist or whatever, buy this book, take this class, do this webinar series with us, and maybe next year, you know, you'll win. And people are gonna buy that stuff. But here's something that I think is really the, um, the most important thing I can say. If you do the math and you figure out how many scripts they get, how much time they have to read them and get notes on them, and you know, get them, get them analyzed before they can pick winners, <laughs> The math is impossible unless they're hiring just schmucks off the street pretty much to do it. Uh, and that's what they do. And I can tell you, I know for a fact that some people I know have taken part or participated in contests where high school kids with no experience reading scripts whatsoever were paid minimum wage to read scripts and write notes. Jesus. And that's real. That's true. That's a true story. So, and by the way, I've been invited to be a judge in screenwriting contests. I've always turned them down because I'm not going to be hypocritical and say, yes, I'll be a judge. But the, what they would tell me, the invitation would say, you know, you don't really have to read the scripts, read a few pages. If it looks like it's going somewhere, finish it. If it doesn't just say so. Well, I would hate to be the guy that paid 125 bucks to enter that contest and find out nobody's reading it. Oh, yeah. Brutal. It, it's brutal. Brutal, brutal. Yeah. And finally, um, I'm going to ask you a few questions, ask all my guests, but this one last question. Is there anything that you can say as far as creating a daily winning routine for writers so they can actually get their scripts written in a timely fashion uh which is that that's the key point timely fashion because you can yeah. write one sentence a day and that's a routine you know but that's not really going to help you out so what would you right. suggest okay well i would suggest doing something other than what a lot of people in my classes have done before i've met them mm -hmm. uh, and that is that they it takes them years to write a script, uh, not months, years. That's a lot. And I'll, yes, I'll meet someone, let's say I'll meet someone in, you know, New York. They, they come to my class and they tell me, I wrote this script, it took me three years to, to get it to this point, and blah, 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 whatever, and I'm almost done. Mm -hmm. I'm almost done with it. And I'll see them again the following year at a class, and I'll say, how did it turn out? I'm almost done with it. <laughs> yes, <Thank> yeah. <laughs> 
I, I, I've, yeah. I've, I've interviewed enough professional screenwriters and I've spoken to enough and I've done enough writing myself to know that professionals don't do that. No. Professionals just do the work. They take three to six months tops to write a screenplay. Most of the times even faster than that. And they just go and it's just a machine and you just keep writing and, you're, and you just keep going. This whole well, like, this is the only script I'm working on for three years. You're done. You're just not, yeah. you're done. Well, what are you going to do next time? I mean, right. Another you know, three years. Let's, like, let's say it turns out great. Yeah. You go to a studio. Sure. They love it as a sample. They, they say, we're not going to buy it. We're not going to make this movie, but we love it. And we think you're unbelievably talented. Uh, we want you to take a crack at this project. The next Iron Man. <laughs> yeah. What do you, no, what are you going to do? Tell them, well, let's see. It's 2019 now. What are you doing in 2022 when I have the first draft done? They're going to throw you out. Right. So, uh, okay. To answer your question, staying on track is a function of having a fantastic outline. Yes. If you, you create that outline and you have it, it's increments that are manageable. You know, I, I don't think outlining in your head is great. Thinking is great. Put it down in some form, either, you know, look, uh, a program like Final Draft has the index card uh, function. Yes, it's great. Buy index cards. You can, and that's what I suggest people do. I actually like the physical cards because there's something about writing out a card, holding it and tacking it up on the wall. But if that's what you're going to do, then write a card at a time. Look at the wall and say, you know, the next thing in my outline was this chase scene. I'm going to write that chase scene right now. And if it takes me all day to do it, well, I can go to sleep tonight looking at myself in the mirror when I'm brushing my teeth and I can say, I did what I set out to do today. I did accomplish that thing. It might be two cards. It might be five. It might be one. I don't know what it is for, for you. But if you have a great outline and you stay on that plan, you can't, you cannot help but get to the end. Just yeah. don't go back. Right. Just don't go back to the previous pages. Go forward. You have plenty of time to rewrite it later. Now I'm, asked, I'm going to ask these questions, ask all my guests, all my guests, what advice would you give a screenwriter wanting to break into the business today? Wow. I had so many thoughts fly Just through. Fly my head. through your second and second, right? Yeah. Um, Read a lot of scripts mm -hmm. and make sure you understand uh, what, how they tell a story. Um, a lot of people write way too much dialogue. A lot of people write too much, you know, action description. And, you know, if you have too much action description on a page, nobody's going to read it. They're going to, I've seen people do it, professional readers, like oh, yeah. industry readers, They'll flip through. And and if that stuff's important, well, you made sure they would never see it right. by overwriting it. So don't do that. So I would say read a lot of scripts until you're comfortable with the idea of how scripts exist. And the other thing I would say is watch a lot of movies. If you're going to write movies, you better watch movies. And it's funny because I'll have friends tell me, I mean, people that are, yeah, they're not as old as I am, but let's say they're 40, 35, mm -hmm. and they want to write the next great Western, mm -hmm. which uh, there's not a huge market for that, but let's say they want to write the next great Western. I'll start talking to them just, you know, so excitedly about the original 310 to Yuma or, you know, Once Upon a Time in the West. Of course. Or something like that. And I just watched them gloss over oh. and seen either one of those movies. Oh, yeah. They've never seen The Magnificent Seven, even though that's not really a Western. But how in the world are you going to write a Western if you haven't seen Westerns? If you haven't seen Sergio Leone's work, like how you can you see it? Or, or Clint's work, like how can you... Yeah, that, and I'll just start naming. I'll just start rattling off movies, and they're like, no, no, never saw it. I'm not saying see it so you can copy them. No, I'm you just saying gotta see what it's done. You got to see it. You have to see how it's done right. <laughs> no question. And it was funny. I was actually doing, a, uh, this is years ago, I was a colorist uh, doing a music video, and this hot, big time, hot, you know, young director who's like 20, 
you know, two or 23. I know who it is, but go ahead. Yeah. And, uh, he was, um, and I'm like, Hey, so do you want me to do kind of like a Blade Runner thing here? And he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm like, you're a music video director and you yeah. haven't studied Tony and Ridley Scott's work. Like, I, are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, no, they're not. <laughs> you know, God. there's a lot of executives that have never seen the movies, classic movies that their studio owns. Yeah, Godfather or. <laughs> yeah. No, I want to tell them, go in the vault, you know, and. and, and sure you can get it for free. I'm sure you can watch it for free. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, come on. It, but you've got to know. You have to watch movies and you have to read scripts. I would say best advice. Absolutely. Now, can you tell me what book had the biggest impact in your life or career? Um, about this stuff? Anything, life or career. Okay, it's not technically not a oh, wow. I don't want to paint myself into a corner with this. Okay, how about this? How about I tell you a script I read that change things for me. Okay. Okay. I, I don't know where I was. I know that I read the screenplay to the firm. The, yeah. Uh, yeah. The yeah. Tom Cruise yeah, yeah. Yeah. Great movie. And yeah, it was a good movie. I, uh, I remember one night I read that script and when I got done with it, I was so impressed and I just thought, wow, the movie's the movie, but this script, if I could ever write something, this Tight. tight. Yeah, you remember my tight. Yeah, man, if I could do that, I, I'm going to be really happy. Another script I read, I read the script uh, for Hannah and her sisters. Oh, yeah. What, I wanted yeah. to jump out the window when I read that because I was like, damn, this. there is no fat in this. There's no wasted word. Yeah. You know, and Woody Allen's dialogue, he's writing stammering. It's yeah. not... It, it's just, it's unbelievable. I wrote to him. I wrote, after I read that script, I wrote a letter to Woody Allen and I said, if I could ever write anything that comes anywhere close to the worst thing you would ever write, then I, I can be happy and I can quit. And he wrote back to me and he said, wow, thanks. I'm glad you like my movies. <laughs> so he took the time to write back to me, but he needed no encouragement, just Thanks. I'm awesome. <laughs> and thank you. Thanks for recognizing that. Um, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Uh, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Very good. So keep basically, your mouth shut, Ash, don't tell the truth. <laughs> Because really, does it matter? I mean, in certain when, scenarios, I would agree with you. Yes, don't tell the truth in certain scenarios, especially when you're dealing in in a creative art in the film business with studios and executives. That I get completely. Yeah, they. You know what? They want a. And as this sounds, I don't know. People are probably if they ever watch this, they're going to be like, God, you should have kept your mouth shut then. Okay, <laughs> but but look, here's the thing. What's most important to higher ups in the entertainment industry is, is that you're a team player. Yeah. They want you to be a team player. They really don't care what your opinion is, especially if it's different than theirs. All right. So really, they just want to be a team player. They want to know I can count on this person to back me up. So that's why I'm saying, like, keep your mouth shut or, you know, say the right things. But listen more, talk less. Yeah. And three of your favorite films of all time. Wow. Okay. Well, Casablanca. Yeah. And that comes up quite often on the show. It has to. It has to. I had a neighbor that hated it and thought it was one of the worst movies ever made. And then I forced him to watch it with me. And uh, I would start it and stop it every 30 seconds. And by the end of it, he got it. He understood why it was so great. He, he's, so, he's also dead inside, but that's another story. <laughs> well, but, but here's the thing. His idea of a good movie was, dude, where's my car? Well, hey, you know. Oh, hey, look, I when, when I was in high school, John claude Van Damme was the greatest actor of all time. You know, so. <laughs> I get it. So, uh, so anyway, yeah, all right. So um, that... The Godfather, of course, and Godfather 2, but I think those are so great that they don't even really belong on the list because they're beyond a they've list. Trans they've transcended the list. Right. So, but I could just, I mean, Once Upon a Time in the West is great. Oh. Um, you know, the, the Wild Bunch for certain reasons oh. is great. Yeah. Um, anything with William Holden, uh, where he plays a real smart ass American, like Stalag 17 mm -hmm. is great or executive suite is great. Uh, -huh. uh, 
pretty much almost anything with Montgomery Cliff is great. <laughs> almost anything with Steve McQueen is great. No, nah, I shouldn't say almost anything, but like Bullet. Oh, Come Bullet's on. insane. Yeah, Bullet. They would never make that movie now because the story not. was complicated enough to where I think executives would think that the audience couldn't follow it now. Yeah, and let alone trying to do all, I mean, all that. Well, it would be all CG now. It wouldn't even right. be. It Cincinnati would, Kid. Yeah, great, great. Well, great. The, 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 uh, going down that line, The Sting. I mean, the Sting, yeah. yes, fantastic. I mean, I mean, when you get Robert Redford and Paul Newman oh. together, I just remember sitting there in the theater looking at them thinking, why can't I be as cool as either one of them? And then, of course, Butch Cassidy, which, you know, I loved William Goldman like as a person. Yeah. Of course, his movies were just ridiculously fantastic. Mm -hmm. But I remember reading an interview with him where he said he hated Butch Cassidy. Why? And he wrote it and he hated it. Why? He said he thought it was too cute. Like the characters were too like, Every, funny and everyone's a critic. <laughs> and I would I would have loved to sit with him and talk to him about it and convince him that he was wrong. <laughs> that would have been a good interview. That would have been a good conversation, when I say at least. Yeah. And then where can people find you in the work that you're doing? Okay. So the work that I'm doing right now, I never talk about. Um, but the work that I've done. Uh, or about me and what I'm doing as far as teaching and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, they should go to my website. It's called MaximumScreenwriting.com. Um, it's got a lot of stuff in there. Uh, there's one like video lesson that's in there. It's like eight minutes long, and it it will tell people about things they've probably not considered when they're writing. Mm -hmm. But I set up classes around the country for writers groups, and I usually teach weekend classes. I pack so much in and it's eight hours saturday eight hours sunday and if they read the testimonials on the website they'll understand what happens during during those classes i'm really happy i've had screenwriting professors from universities and film schools come and take the class all kinds of creative executives have taken it obviously writers take it all the time but that's what i do and i love doing that more than anything right now because i like to see the light go on you know, when I tell someone something and boom, I see the the flicker. Fair enough. Hey, man, Jeff, thank you for uh, dropping some major knowledge bombs today and also some amazing stories uh, mm -hmm. along the way, too. So thanks for taking the time out.